And we have Emily Lakdawalla. Hi. I can't hear you. I'm <laughs> sorry, you? that would be my fault. Yay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, and I think oh, we're reading on uh, Kevin Grazier and Kiki Sanford. So uh, uh, Kevin is on his way over. And uh, Kiki, we are waiting for you in the green room. Uh, you've probably gotten an invite already to the green room uh, or and or a link in your email. So that's where that should, should be coming from. Um, Pamela, tell me you're not wearing Google Glass. I am, and I was just checking a tweet I got. <laughs> she just got it on Thursday. <laughs> well, congratulations. You are the first non-male person I've seen wearing Google Glass. Nice. <laughs> that means you haven't seen Nicole wearing hers. Mine's charging. Okay. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, it's true. There is predominantly men wearing them right now, but we decided we're going to break into the boys club of Google Glass and pwn them with science. We, we do that a lot. We break into boys clubs a lot. I mean, we're astronomers. <laughs> oh, well, and I have to say You're kudos programmer. to you because on uh, Dot Astronomy, I don't know if you saw the article, but well, roughly half of the people who signed up to attend Dot Astronomy were women. Only two women, and I believe that would make you one of them, submitted abstracts. I did. Sweet. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Yay. Uh, yeah, I saw around they did a, a second call uh, for, for abstracts. They said, hey, look, you know, you know, whatever idea you have, put that in. So we want to try and bring the, uh, bring the ratio of speakers up since half the conference is women. So yeah. uh, that's a good thing to do if you're doing a conference. Be representative of your community with the speakers. So kudos to that. Yeah. And, and uh, I know there's a movement out there that if you end up on a panel that isn't mixed, to say you won't be on the panel. And I know, especially for early career people, that it's is really a terrifying hard. thing to consider doing it. Um, I actually, uh, I uh, recently um, attended and spoke at a conference in Tucson where I noticed that they had maybe about uh, seven out of 32 speakers were women, but there were no women on any of the panels. And so I said, hey, look, there's no woman on any, any of the panels. And before I knew it, this boondoggle of a trip that I got myself on, I was now on three panels. So it kind oh, of wow. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, oh, we now have a Kevin. Have a Kevin? Yes, he was out. Yes. I think we have muted Kevin. You may need to unmute yourself. It's the orange thing that looks like an old school microphone in the, actually on you, it'll be on that side, on the upper right-hand side of your screen. We see your mouth moving. Uh, so, so Emily, while Kevin struggles with the technology, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Emily Lakdawalla. I am Senior Editor and Planetary Evangelist for the Planetary Society. We are the world's largest space interest organization, a non-governmental group founded in 1980 by Carl Sagan, Lou Friedman, and Bruce Murray to advocate for space research and exploration. And uh, that's exactly what we're doing right now at a time when uh, planetary science is actually under attack in uh, the United States federal budget, yeah. although not so much in foreign budgets, as it turns out. They're um, doing a good job at ESA and JAXA, and then China is actually branching out, going to be launching toward the moon and Mars pretty soon. So, um, you know, uh, space exploration will continue without us, but we're working on advocating for um, the Americans to continue following up on the amazing successes that we've had over the last decade. And so I write about those successes, um, both uh, domestic and foreign, and exploring all of the um, solar systems, planets, and moons, and things that uh, really ought to be um, considered just as exciting as all the planets are, even though they're just moons. So, um, do we have audio from Kevin yet? I think so. Ooh, yes, yay. we do. Uh, so, Kevin, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself out to our crowd? Uh, my name is Kevin Grazier. I, I am a former JPLer. I was on the Cassini spacecraft, Cassini mission for 15 years. Um, I am now a full-time writer. Um, I've got a couple books I'm working on. Plus, I am also a science advisor on the TV series Defiance and Falling Skies, and the I movie, love both of those. Uh, yeah, and the movie um, this fall called Gravity with uh, George Clooney and Sandra Bullock. We plugged that a good, a movie. that promo pretty hard uh, in the weekly space hangout. That was amazing. You've seen the promo? Yes, yes, yes. It, it goes from from silent to intense pretty darn quickly. 
So, so yeah, I'm, I, I work in the entertainment industry pretty much full time. But, but you were a Cassini scientist for a number of years, and you must be digging the random uh, Saturn that has joined you. So that was perfectly timed. Cassini scientist meets uh, Earth-based image of Saturn. Saturn. Um, so we may also be joined um, by... I'm also, I mean, I'm still, I'm still a scientist. What was that? What? There's a little bit of a delay. Yeah. Oh, we may be having some lag in our audio. Well, what I'm going to do is just throw yeah, there's a little bit. I feel like... <laughs> Technology making awkward people even more awkward. <laughs> oh, how did we go Avatar? Is it us doing the lag then? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. You guys seem fine to me. I okay. think it's uh, Kevin having issues. Yeah, I'm not okay. experiencing any lag. Um, so, so we may be joined by Dr. Kiki Stanford tonight as well from um, This Week in Science. I think we're having some trouble reaching out to her this evening. Um, so the theme of this hour is how do we communicate science through all of our different means from Emily with her blog, uh, Kiki with her uh, news informational uh, cast and Kevin working through the mass media and I have to say uh, Kevin taught more about how vacuums will and won't explode humans and harm their bodies in one episode of Battlestar Galactica than all of science fiction prior to him on TV and I adore that you did that right, Kevin. Um, so so I, want, I want to talk about well, all the different ways. My, my boss is listening to me. <laughs> so, so why don't you go ahead and tell the story about how you got that on and, and then um, I, I'd like to hear each of you discuss how it is that you work to, to get science out to mainstream people and not those of us who live and breathe it every day, either as hobbyists or as pros. How do we truly meet the masses? And let's start by how you got your bosses to do it right, Kevin. Um, at that time, okay, let, let me start with the whole story. Um, the episode Pamela was ref to which she was referring is, was called A Day in the Life, and it was a third season episode. So by that time, I'd been working with them for you know, quite a while, and, and there was a level of trust. But there was an, an episode where we had a married couple who was trapped in a very large uh, freight airlock that had a slow leak, and they couldn't get out. They couldn't actuate the door, so the, the air was leaking out, and they had, they had a newborn, so, oh, my God, we are going to die and leave behind an orphan. So um, what they ended up deciding was the best solution to this is to um, put a Raptor, a spacecraft, outside, open it up, put, put people in spacesuits, um, <clears throat> blow the explosive bolts on the airlock, and the remaining air would push our brave heroes out of the airlock into the waiting Raptor, close it, pressurize it, bring them aboard, treat the symptoms. Um, afterwards, after that aired, we got grief that, um, oh my God, they, they so would have popped. No, they wouldn't have unless they held their breath. Um, the, what's the air going to do? Is it going to go blow out your lungs like an alien or is it going to take the path of least resistance and go out your mouth? Well, it goes out your mouth except for some very small constrictions, constrictive areas like the, the blood vessels in your eyes, your nose, and maybe your eardrum might rupture. Um, oh my God, they'd freeze. Because space is cold. It's very cold in space, quoting Khan, version 1.0. And, um, well, yes, it is cold, but a vacuum is an insulator. So they would have to radiate away their heat, and that's a slow process, so they wouldn't lose hardly any heat. They wouldn't be any colder in this 10-second ride through space than they were um, uh, beforehand, when you see, for example, the astronaut um, whose arm gets exposed in the movie Sunshine, it hits a railing and shatters, that's completely wrong. Um, and what you'll notice, so basically, um, they didn't pop, they didn't freeze, they bring them aboard. The next time you see these two people, the, um, they're in sick bay, and when he bed, he is moving really slowly because he has the bends and that attacks your joints. So he hurts like hell. And then he goes to the next room where his wife is in a hyperbaric chamber and she obviously didn't you know, deal with the, the stresses as well as he did. And when she looks over at him, you see that the blood vessels in her eyes had popped. And so from beginning to end, that was done correctly simply because they listened to me. That's it. 
They just you need um, in, in the entertainment industry, you need a science advisor and you need writers and producers willing to listen. I remember that episode. That was a stunning episode, uh, not just the science, but the plot as well. And that's a, another example, as we were saying, of the meshing of science and plot to give a good story. And, and I'm really digging watching Defiance, where you have this great premise of there is complete carnage of spacecraft above the planet. And they run into problems with it occasionally raining from the sky and things like that. So you seem to have, again, I think this is some of the same crew from Battlestar Galactica that you're working with. Um, on both Falling Skies and Defiance, I'm working with people I've worked with on Battlestar. And in both cases, um, even though it doesn't always show, you would be amazed the degree to which science informs the series. It's, Especially it's Falling been... Skies and the next coming, and this, this current season we just started. Ooh. I, you know, I can't even say especially, because they're both. Um, there's a lot of science that goes behind a lot of this stuff. And, and we have a login with our cable company just so that I can watch Falling Skies on TNT on my computer. Now, Emily, you're at the other side of the spectrum where you are discussing hardcore science as someone communicating just the science without having the draw of the, the fiction and the high production values. And you're working to build an audience of your own. How is it that you uh, focus your energies in trying to reach out to the public with science? Well, it, it helps that space science and solar system exploration in particular is just such an easy sell because the pictures are so freaking awesome. No, almost none of these spacecraft head to space without a really nice camera. And the pictures that they take, the, the cameras are, are there for scientific purposes. Every single pixel in an image is actually a, a measurement, a count of the number of photons of certain wavelengths that have hit a detector, and that's how scientists regard them. But the pictures, even the crummiest detector, produces just absolutely amazing visions of these other worlds that we've never visited before. I think one of my favorite pictures of all time has to be one of the lowest quality images that's been returned in my memory, and that's the one that was taken by the Huygens probe um, that was uh, attached, uh, it, it rode to Saturn on Cassini and then landed on a moon of Saturn. And it's amazing how many people out there don't know yet that we actually landed a probe on the surface of a moon with an atmosphere on an outer planet in the solar system. And that little image that it returned, it was tiny. It was only a couple of hundred pixels wide. And yet it was this alien surface of another world that, you, that we had never imagined seeing before. And it was both strange and familiar. And so just pictures and stories like that are, are uh, they're, they're so easy to sell. People hear them and they're absolutely amazed. And I, and I actually have to do very little work. All I need is a platform and a place to show it. And that's what the Planetary Society gives me at planetary.org. And I can show these pictures and, and tell the stories of amazing exploration. And more and more missions right now are making it easier to follow along and, and experience the mission in near real time because they're sharing the photos that they send back from these other worlds on the Internet almost as soon as they arrive on Earth. And so we get things like the Curiosity mission where, and Opportunity as, as well, where we can actually see images taken on the surface of Mars uh, just hours af after they were taken, which never ceases to amaze me. The sun hasn't yet set on Curiosity on the same day that I am seeing these pictures, and it's just stunning. It's amazing stuff. I'm working on bringing up some of these images to share. <laughs> well, I can bring them up too. Um, yeah, but then we couldn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so anyway, I think that um, it, it, I, I found myself often, I, I'd be like at a party at, at my college reunion, you know, the fifth, fifth college reunion, the, the bass was thumping, there was alcohol flowing freely, and yet somebody would be like, so, uh, Pluto's not a planet anymore, can you explain that? And so I'd be like shouting above the music trying to explain to them what, that Pluto itself had not actually changed, that it was merely a semantic discussion, and that the reason that it had changed is because there's so many other cool things that we're discovering out there. Other things like Harris and Haumea and Kwawar and Makimaki Maki and uh, um, other kinds of uh, Varina, Varuna and Chaos and Ixion and all kinds of wonderfully named objects. And that the sad thing about Pluto's demotion is that it hasn't resulted in the promotion of these other things, that all these other worlds that we're discovering out there in the outer solar system.
Are you look? So we're looking through Cassini Huygens. Yeah, these these are images. the images returned by Huygens that are available on the European Space Agency's website. Um, I will go ahead and share this link um, to Nicole, who can share it to everything else because she's connected to everything else. Sure. And of course. One of the things that I really enjoy doing is to feature work of uh, members of the public who take the spacecraft image data. Um, and it, it's spacecraft image data that um, is owned by the public. It's in the public domain. It's, it's hosted on uh, NASA and ESA and JAXA websites for everybody to use. And when scientists process their image data, they're usually looking to emphasize very faint features, you know, to try to understand what's going on on a surface. Um, and, and those kinds of enhancements that they do, they're important for science, but they're generally not aesthetically appealing. And so when you get somebody who is really good at image processing to take some of this image data and make it beautiful, it's the, there are the, just absolutely stunning views of uh, other worlds come out that you just never imagined were there. There are people who work with Voyager and Viking and even Mariner data, really old and often kind of gnarly stuff, and they produce absolutely amazing images. You can see them on our website if you go to planetary.org and under multimedia you can pick out space images, and there's hundreds of images there, um, many of which have been processed by amateurs to look absolutely stunning. And there are views that have been sitting around on public servers for years and years, just nobody yet um, before these people have gone in and, and processed and lovingly erased all of the data dropouts and, and uh, Rizzo marks and other blemishes and, and brought out the beautiful views that were sitting there just for decades waiting to be seen. And and the the reason that this hasn't happened previously is if if you're working on NASA funded projects, you have to do what the project pays you to do. And you have to spend as much time as it allocates. And there's so many things that we want to do, but we can't accomplish everything on our own given the resources that we have. And one of my favorite examples of this is, uh, is it Ted Strike? Is that the right pronunciation of the last name? Ted Stikey? I'm having a moment of, of fail. Strike is close enough. Okay. Um, he, he's a philosophy professor at a small college, and in his spare time, he downloads the data from old missions, reprocesses it, and he took the old, horrible images uh, from the Mariner days of Mercury and completely reprocessed it with modern software, modern techniques, and created this beautiful map prior to Messenger getting to Mercury. And new science could be done because for the first time ever, they could make out very faint uh, variations in coloration, albedo features. Uh, he similarly, similarly has reprocessed Voyager data that allowed people to trace out fault lines on some of the moons that had previously just not quite been, been capable of being seen because they were in some of the shadowed regions that just needed better feature enhancement that he was able to do. And it's gotten to the point that several different NASA missions will fund him a philosophy professor to do image reduction for them prior to their missions getting to these new worlds. And this has led to some confusion at his university because here he is, a philosophy professor, getting grant money and they want him to get grant money, but the grant money is in astronomy and he's not an astronomy professor, so how do you count this towards tenure? And it's a wonderful problem to have. It is a wonderful problem to have and, and, it's, and it is um, a time when uh, you know, it used to be back in the 18th and 19th centuries, you had these, you know, gentlemen scientists. The science was often being advanced by people who had independent wealth and were able to just dabble in science in their spare yeah. time. Um, and that fell away for a long time when science be was something that you could only do if you were really heavily funded. Um, and nowadays, it's it's back in the time when, when citizens can actually make huge contributions to science. And I know that you guys, uh, I'm looking at, at two people who are really at the forefront of helping citizens get involved in actually contributing to science projects. And, and you know, we couldn't do this without the help that we get from you guys. Uh, you and Matt Kaplan have done so much to help us out with the Hangouts, to support us, and to help us get the word out about what we're doing. Yeah, and, and now Casey Dreyer as well, he's joined the Weekly Space Hangout. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. So, more people. Yes. Absorb all the people. <laughs> Emily just kind of roped him in there. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank um, you for that. And, and this is a collaboration, and I know one of the fantasies that you and I have uh, that hopefully we'll get to make into a reality that you're doing donations will help fund make possible uh, your donation 
Funding from your donations will help make this possible. Get all the words in the correct order into the sentence. <laughs> I can Starting see to Emily very to poised there. laughing at me. Um, I'm laughing with you all the way, Pamela. <laughs> I love you, Emily. <laughs> but, Let me share some pretty pictures while you guys get recomposed. I'm going to show you, Thank you. Um, my uh, this right here. Actually, I'm going to back up just one step, two steps. This is my amateur space images archive on, on the planetary.org. You can actually also get there by going to amateurspaceimages.org if you can spell amateur correctly, although I do have one misspelled version. So if you misspell it one the most obvious way, then you will still get here. And we just have photo after photo. I've recently added a whole bunch of stuff from Galileo and Voyager at the icy moons of Jupiter. Um, but if you uh, go back and back, you get absolutely amazing photos. Like I love these images that, that show two different worlds at the same time. This is Dione down here and this is Titan in a version processed actually by me. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of my stuff on here, but there's a lot of other amateur image process stuff on here as well from all kinds of different worlds. Here's a, an amazing view of a very strangely shaped world, Comet Hartley 2. Um, again, processed by me. That wasn't intentional. <laughs> but we have lots and lots of pretty photos, the kinds of which um, many people just haven't seen because the data, like I said, the data are out there for anybody who wants to use it to make pretty illustrations and all you have to do is climb up a very steep learning cliff in order to understand how to locate, download, and uh, convert the data into a, a format that, that's a little bit more familiar to most people. But once you overcome those couple of steps, then any, uh, you know, just basic stuff like adjusting brightness and contrast and cropping will turn kind of gnarly looking data into some really, really pretty looking pictures. And, and one of the, the things that you and I have spoken about doing in the past is putting together an image miners codex that would be a joint project between the Planetary Society and CosmoQuest that would help people um, document in a wiki what is it that's needed to climb those mountains and get your data processed. Where do you go to get the different data? Um, but in the interim, the Planetary Society has this wonderful forum that I know you're one of the leaders of that, that I'd love to hear you tell our audience about. Sure, it's called unmannedspaceflight.com. I am not responsible for unmanned being the title of this thing. It was created by a Brit, and I guess in, in Europe they're not quite so touchy about manned spaceflight versus crewed spaceflight and so on. But anyway, unmannedspaceflight.com. It is an online forum. Um, for people who are interested in uh, messing about with, uh, with spacecraft image data. It was founded by a British guy who was eagerly anticipating the landing of Beagle 2 on Mars. And when that didn't work out quite as well as people had hoped, um, he turned to the images that were being returned by Spirit and Opportunity. Um, and over the first year or so, he was joined by a couple of dozen other um, really super nerds who were just really into processing those photos, and they would make color combinations and talk about what Opportunity and Spirit were doing next. But after a while, um, it, it began to snowball, and, and I had found that a couple, the, a lot of the time when I was looking for really detailed information about what was going on on a mission, particularly the rovers, Google would lead me to unmannedspaceflight.com. And I still find that today. When I'm looking for information that I can't quite remember, some quirky detail about something that happened at a particular moment with a particular event or a particular spot on Mars or Saturn or whatever, my Google searches bring me back to unmannedspaceflight.com. And so it's a, it's a community that's really, really closely following the events that are happening on missions. And then um, we discuss uh, all the facts that we know and speculate about some that we don't, and we share our processed versions of images. And uh, one of the reasons that I created this Amateur Space Images website was because of all of the amazing stuff being posted at Unmanned Space Flight. But it was just an online forum with like attachments to posts. And it was really, really difficult to search and find um, the, those pretty pictures that I knew existed there. So I created AmateurSpaceImages.com as, a, um, as a, a repository for all of that amazing amateur processed image data that had been showing up at Unmanned Space Flight. And I'm one of a... Of a um, small but proud team of about a dozen uh, admins and mods from all over the world. It's a truly international place. Other mods are from Australia and uh, Iceland and um, uh, all over the place. And it's just, it's a really fun um, community to be a part of. And 
What, what gets me is I've in the past sent one of my grad students there to find out how do you deal with certain types of image headers from lunar reconnaissance or, orbiter data. And if you're a grad student at a small university, you don't necessarily have a senior postdoc or another graduate student whom you can go to. Um, but unmanned space pl flight was willing to pe play that mentoring role. And um, it, it's just really awesome. And if, if you want to get involved in creating the space imagery for yourself, um, they're the place to get started. And in the future, hopefully, we will get around to writing that image mi miners <laughs> codex that we've been talking about for several years. Yeah, the, I, I have to admit, the community is not particularly friendly to people who try to use unmanned spaceflight as a Google search engine. We, we no. require people to do their Google searches first, but once they've exhausted that, then we're happy to answer their questions. <laughs> so, and we have Kevin back. Is your connection better now? Uh, I hope so. How's it sound? You sound okay. I hear you. Good, good. So, I, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of uh, computational research, and uh, I had a bunch of windows open to the University of Auckland, which is my collaborators are, so I think that's what crashed my computer. Mm. Anyway, so hi. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> so we, we were just talking about amateur data reduction, and it, it's really... It, awe-inspiring to me how many people there are out there waiting to nitpick when you get the details wrong. Whether it be NASA puts out a press release that has Mars flipped upside down, uh, or uh, I know this was Neil deGrasse Tyson's pet peeve, but the movie Titanic has uh, the stars wrong. Um, does Knowing the public is watching make you fight a little bit harder to get the science right in the TV shows that you work with, Kevin? Um, <clears throat> the producers, writers, they all know, they're all aware that my name's on this and that I'm, um, that I catch the flack when it's not perfect. Um, we're going to tell a good story. Science in a science fiction show is to serve the story. Um, I don't have to remind anybody of that. Um, they're all aware of that, some more than others, but they, you know, they all know that that um, I'm the one who catches the flack if something is, is not perfect. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is going back to our early example, we're going to catch flack sometimes even when it is perfect. So you just have to, at some point in time, have to do the best job you can and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. well, <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is, is since I do work on a, a several Hollywood TV series, there is ample opportunity to appear at conventions and speaking and, you know, um, keynotes and things like that and set the record straight and talk about real science. So that's a really big end to talking about real science. So even if they um, it's, it, you complain, that's sometimes a teachable moment as well. It drives the conversation. Sorry? It drives the conversation back towards the science, and that's um, absolutely what do at all the sci-fi cons, yeah. I often find myself coming to NASA and other space agencies' defense because um, when they, uh, you know, they're switching now to putting out more image data and more information about missions in a in a more rapid manner. But of course, with speed comes errors. Yes. And so um, one of the most common things that happens is that they will release a picture that's mirror reversed because spacecraft image. Uh, detectors, they don't, it doesn't really matter which way you read it out, left or right, and honestly for the geology, it, it really doesn't matter that much whether it's mirror reversed or not. So it's it's often happened, and about half the images of the asteroid Lutetia, for instance, that are out there are actually mirror reversed. It's just not obvious unless they release an image of Earth that's mirror reversed, in which case people do tend to eventually notice that. And so, but it actually turns out to be a teachable moment. One of the worst ones is Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, because of the way their images are made with two image strips side by side, it's a pair of cameras, and the way that the cameras are mounted to the spacecraft, one of them is mounted upside down with respect to the other, so to get the image to, to knit together properly, they read one backwards and they read one uh, forwards in order to get them to match. But when they store it in the planetary data system, they don't bother mirror flipping the other one. So you know that one of them is mirror flipped, but the other one isn't. Uh, but they don't tell you which one. And it gets worse because every time that the orbit, that the uh, 
the Terminator drifts around in order that the, the time of day shifts. They have to turn the spacecraft upside down in its orbit. It's not upside down to the spacecraft. It's 180 degrees. And so that flips which one they have to read right to left and which one they have to read left to right. And it's incredibly confusing. And the only way that I can figure out which way is the right way around is to go to lunar orbiter images. These are the ones that were taken in the 1960s that map the moon for the Apollo missions. And it's using lunar orbiter images that I can determine which way is the right way around for the modern lunar reconnaissance orbiter images. And you know, for geology, it, it mostly it just doesn't matter, and so they don't particularly care about it. Anyway, they have the navigational data on their computers, and their fancy software handles it automatically. But for those of us out here in the public, we have to try to do what we can to figure out which way is right, right side up and which way is upside down. There's an incredible amount of, of uh, bookkeeping in, in astronomy, yeah. something I, I quickly learned uh, when I started doing research as an undergrad. Uh, you got to know uh, all the settings of your instruments, uh, like you're saying, which ones flipped or not even. Uh, there's an incredible amount of the analysis is, is, is bookkeeping as well. Yeah. And so, uh, of course, uh, our, our guys over at CosmoQuest have done that for you. Yes. <laughs> really and nice. and so I, I have to admit, one of the reasons uh, that um, our our <laughs> Mercury Mappers site has been so slow coming out of beta. Is uh, we keep getting the sun in the wrong place in the images because we, we mark where the sun should be in the sky, and about a third of the data that we get, the sun has been misplaced, and we have to figure out: uh, do we add 90? Do we add 180? Do we rotate? Um, and and it gets complicated trying to figure out what is the correct way. Do you flip or rotate? Those those are very different actions. Yeah. Um, so it keeps it it keeps a challenge going for us. Yeah. In fact, the um, when the the site new site launches tonight or tomorrow at some point. Um, I we are either launching tonight during the coder segment or tomorrow during the final hour. Okay. I know the guys are currently desperately going through and double checking everything one last time. We but didn't want to bork the site. I think we may wait to the last hour because we have all the special hand done links for the hangout live right now. Um, but uh, they, it's going to come live, set with the new set of video tutorials, and the sun is not quite in the right place, so they are temporary tutorials until we get the sun fixed, and thus get the the uh, real tutorials up. But I, you know, we put up a, a set of tutorials to show you the, the new functions. And and I love the sentences that come out of our mouths working in this field. <laughs> when the sun is in the right place, it's we end up saying these crazy Corey things. Corey, fix the sun. Yes. <laughs> is often what I say. So, so to, to go back to, to what we were originally talking about, which is trying to get out to the mainstream market, um, Kevin, you have no difficulty because your stuff is on network TV getting to the mass, mass market, but how do you get the mass market to, to, or can you even try to get the mass market to be inspired to go out and look into the real science uh, without being inspired to go to the cons, get the people who are non-con goers interested? The non-con goers? Um, no, there are plenty of people who are interested in science who wouldn't be caught dead at a convention because it's that sticky sci-fi stuff. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are really just, I care about the science. I mean, let me let me back up. Um, as I've been on several episodes of The Universe, with you in fact, yes. and there are people who would watch The Universe who wouldn't watch Defiance or Battlestar. So um, there are... People, there's science in different ways on, on you know, TV. So there are ways of reaching them through documentaries that um, are somewhat different than from um, through, through sci-fi. Does that make sense? That's your question, I guess, is a bit more important question. <laughs> yeah, it does. Hello? It just seems that uh, sci-fi is such okay. an obvious way to reach people about science uh, that you wouldn't normally, may not normally be consumers of science. And I'm just you know, it is, but the, the fact is, some people, you know, you know, science fiction by definition usually takes one big leap, and some people that leap bothers them because they're science purists, so they don't they never watch science fiction. I've often felt that that the science fiction fans are kind of an untapped. Um, audience for what's actually going on um, in scientific exploration, but as I, I have tried to put feelers out into into those groups, and 
it's it's not obvious to me that it's a perfect match because I realized when I uh, started going to like um, nerdist events and stuff like that 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 these people were it's it's kind of escapist and nostalgic in its orientation and and neither one of those and and I'm not saying that either of those is a bad thing I'm just saying that both of those are not really a great fit for the actuality of exploring space so it's a uh, the, but, the but match is not as perfect did just as it have Buzz Aldrin on, on the Nerdish show, so that was pretty epic. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long time since Buzz Aldrin was actually exploring space, though. Yes. <laughs> no disrespect to, to uh, our, our awesome astronaut, because I, he, is, he, is, uh, he is a force of nature. Um, but, you know, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about real, uh, the, the things that are going on right now, people driving rovers across the surface of Mars. Those well, are the and people Bobak that I was on see. that episode as well, though. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's they a start. They them against each other in a trivia contest that was uh, clearly <laughs> rigged. Nice. <laughs> you know, honestly, I want to see Chris Hadwick against uh, Hadfield. The, oh, the, uh, Hardwick Hard versus Hadfield. Yes. Make it happen, Twitter. <laughs> it needs to happen. This needs to be a thing. Death match. Death match or, or, or quiz show? Or joy match. I'll go with joy match. Joy match? Yeah, the opposite of death match. Okay. <laughs> I, so, Tickle so fest! There, there was an episode, I think it was of the Nerdist from Comic-Con last year, where Will Wheaton and Matt Smith met each other and had a moment of squee mm. when Matt Smith realized Will Wheaton was the kid from Stand By Me. He didn't know anything about Next Generation. He only knew about Stand By Me. And he had funny. a total squee, and Will Wheaton was like, meeting the doctor! And it was just this moment of pure delight, and we need moments of pure delight more often. Sounds good to me. Well, I went to the um, a screening of the um, of the season finale of the Big Bang Theory about a year ago, and it's I I didn't I don't watch much TV, so I was familiar with the Big Bang Theory and the characters, but I I wasn't familiar with the with the episode arc. But it was the one where there was the wedding and and the mm -hmm. launch and the Soyuz. And so there was a screening, and they had um, a couple of the people from the show, and they also had Mike Massimino, who was the Hubble repairman astronaut who was um, uh, had a cameo in that particular episode. He was launching he was in, in the Soyuz episodes. as well. Yeah, but yeah, he's been in several episodes. And so anyway, there was a Q and A after they screened the episode, and and everybody else in the audience was asking questions about what was going to happen next season, and you know um, was you know were I don't know just basically about uh, about the characters and what was going to happen with the plot and. Finally, Bill Prady stopped the audience. He said, look, guys, I want to point out that there is a man sitting next to me who has actually been to space. You guys should be asking him questions. And so I That's took that as my mean. cue, and I asked a couple of my questions. But I was the only one in the audience, really, who was asking questions. Like oh, that. That's interesting. <laughs> fail. Yeah, big fail. Uh, Ma Massimino told a really funny story, though. He was saying that he was um, getting ready for one of the shuttle launches. It was like the dress rehearsal the day before the launch. And so they're all suited up. They were, they were in that white room that was like right right in the anteroom to the shuttle. And all of a sudden, the phone on the wall rings. And it's one of those like red phones that has no dial or anything. It's just, it's like the hotline from the president or something. So somebody goes over and answers it. And they say, Mike, it's for you. And and Mike was like, did somebody die? I mean, what what could be so horrible that this phone would ring and it would be for me? And he picks up the phone and it was his wife saying, where is our son's science project? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'll bet Neil Armstrong never got a phone call like that. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, I actually, I, I auditioned for. Um, th there was a show that was, um, it was a science show, a documentary type show, and they needed two hosts, and they were they had a bunch of people there to audition, and they were pairing people up to see how the chemistry was, and I got to help Mike Massimino get into a thermal suit the kind that will handle like 900 degree temperatures. That thing is stiff and he's a big guy. So that was an interesting uh, uh, audition. Wow. Yeah, I want to meet Mike. That was, yeah, that was, it was a lot of fun. And, right. and Gold, I just got your message on my uh, Google Glass. Uh, you want to reach out to Miss Array on Twitter at M-I-S-S-A-R-R-A-Y. Someone just texted her in the face. Yes. <laughs> Uh, also, I want to point out, James has put a Barlow lens in on Saturn, so Ooh, I'm going to... shiny, it's, fainter. It's fainty, fainter, less shiny, but... Uh, yes, this is um, actually a Teleview 5X Barlow. Uh, it uh, does an amazing job of both increasing the uh, zoom of the image and also s somehow magically maintaining uh, 
the same amount of quality. I'm not sure how they do that. I guess they uh, have a, like some sort of wizard that does that. But uh, <laughs> what I was just pointing out to Nicole, energy. you can actually make out the shadow of Saturn against the rings. Yeah, we saw that earlier too. Yeah, uh, but I can see it the small screen a little bit. So just wanted to point out the extra Saturn. All the Saturn. All the extra Saturn. And I can still go back to the moon if anybody wants to see the moon. <laughs> so, so, oh, here's here's the, oh my gosh! <laughs> Here, by the way, is me in the mock-up of the Soyuz that they used on the Big Bang Theory show with Mike Massimino. Excellent. So that's that's one of my favorite photos. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> My mom watches Big Bang Theory. I keep bringing up my mom. <laughs> I miss my mommy. Um, and because, uh, you know, it may, she, she said it makes her think of me. And uh, she didn't realize that was a real astronaut. Yeah. And I, I pointed that out to her, and she thought that was so cool because uh, she watches it for the entertainment. And uh, actually, when uh, my, my significant other and I watch the show, uh, we laugh at different parts. Uh, I, my I husband laugh. and I, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and I don't know about you, but... I, I was like half watching because I was in my email, in my work, and Mike Massimo came on. I was like, oh, that's Mike. And <laughs> my husband just looked at me like a crazy person, which he does on a regular basis. But yeah, we do, we do geek at our different things. Yeah. So, okay. Kevin, you're working on some neat shows. It, with Defiance, you're having to come up with a whole variety of biologically compatible but very distinct aliens. Do you get to have any say in the biology side of things? Uh, yeah, we've had a lot of talk about the aliens, and um, without getting spoiler, I don't know how much I can say. Yes, but yes we, we've discussed alien biology on several occasions. I guess that's all I can say right at this point in time. Okay. <laughs> well, the, all the actors are human, so you're you're uh, restricted by that. I, I, well, I I think there was actually an interesting giveaway yeah, on Sci-Fi's Face Off makeup series. There's this fascinating reality show on the Sci-Fi Channel called Face Off, where it's competitions of people who do special effects makeup, and they were on the set of Defiance, and their assignment was to design hybrids of the different aliens from Defiance. Well, that is a spoiler, isn't it? <laughs> mm. Okay, we just got Look the five the minutes. No, yeah, I would say I wouldn't read too much into that. Oh, we just got the five-minute warning from our Google Hangout I once again. I wouldn't read too much into that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I don't know. We're gonna ship. We're gonna ship a bit <laughs> as we continue to watch the show. Of course, we Can live I just outside of St. Louis, and so there's a little bit of uh, fun uh, seeing the set there, uh, seeing where it, where it's set. Uh, trying to imagine that seeing our city parse. Uh, post Armageddon buried underneath a flipped yeah. over crust. <laughs> but the arch is there. The arch is there. The arch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We got the five minute warning from our oh, Google Hangout. <laughs> Once again, it's going to be closing down on us in just a few minutes. Uh, so I will be racing to start a new Hangout. Uh, what you can do to follow along is uh, check the Cosmo Quest at Cosmo Quest X on Twitter. Uh, I will tweet the new YouTube link from there. There's a part four event on Google+, Plus, which you can check out or continue to stay on the main event page um, since that's where we are checking comments as well. Uh, we will embed it there. We'll embed it on CosmoQuest.org, CosmoQuest.org slash Hangouts. <laughs> um, All will, the places. Yes, yeah, so, so follow us into the next hour, next four hours. Uh, the next segment is VSP. The next segment is going to be the virtual star party. And um, Frasier et al. You're you're up. We will on be sending deck. you invites. <laughs> so let's get some parting words from Emily and Kevin. Well, I just have to share some awesome news that I just heard from Mars rover driver Scott Maxwell, which is that this thing is actually going to become a saleable, uh, purchasable Lego kit. It's an MSL made out of Lego through Lego Kusu. So that's my favorite piece of news from today. Yay! Awesome. Yay! Kevin? I just uh, edited a book that's about uh, science in Hollywood. It's called um, Hollywood Chemistry, When Science Met Entertainment. It's supposed to sound kind of like when Harry met Sally. And it's an anthology, um, and we have a really eclectic anthology of um, 
of writers, producers, directors, scientists. Um, I even did a um, chapter with Bear McCreary, who's a composer. And I highly recommend that because um, this is less about explaining the science on screen and more about the process of how we get science in displays and then the result of that science on the audience. And it's, um, we had a lot of great essays, but I think when people understand that process more, many will be less likely to nitpick when they understand you know, how many voices speak through a screenplay. But it's really, it's, it's a fascinating um, book. This, I edited it, um, Twitter scientists were editors, and my showrunner from Eureka, Jamie Paglia, was, a, was an editor and contributed a chapter. So I, that, when that book, look out, it's through the American Chemical Society. Um, it's called, again, Hollywood Chemistry, When Science Met Entertainment. And it really goes into detail in many respects of how we get science into um, onto TV and into film. That sounds awesome. Now, Google is going to cut us off any second now. So we're going to shut down before they shut us down. Uh, stay tuned. The link will come out on Twitter and uh, Google Plus and all the other places. If you could all please help us share the link. We'd be very happy, and you're going to need to refresh your pages if you are on the main event, the Hangout page, or the home page of CosmoQuest. Here we go. Again. Thank you, Emily and Kevin. You're welcome. Bye, you're everybody. Welcome. See you in a minute.